For this video, I was going to do some live coding and implement motion detection logic, but that was a naive hope. I ended up encountering several hurdles that took days to sort out, mainly because this was the first time I'd ever worked with YUV420 data. It wouldn't have been enjoyable to watch. So instead, in this video, we'll review a typical motion detection algorithm, show the preliminary pass of that in the Pimera code base, review some challenges I encountered, and cover what I learned. As always, you can find the code for this project here at the bottom. First, let's explain what motion detection typically looks like. First step is usually to convert RGB pixel data to grayscale. Then for each pixel in the current frame, subtract it from the corresponding pixel in the previous frame. Take the absolute value of the subtraction. If the value is above a certain threshold, consider the pixel as having changed. If enough pixels have changed, we've detected motion. The atoms in bold point to three questions we need to answer first. What does previous frame mean? In my case, it's either the first frame returned by the camera or the last frame where motion was detected. I don't compare with the frame that came immediately before the current frame because that wouldn't detect very slow moving objects. Two, what threshold should we use to consider a pixel as having changed? I use 35. Some examples online use 25. So perhaps this is something that should be configurable by the end user. Lastly, what number of pixels need to change before we are certain that motion was detected? I normally use values between half of a percent and 1% of the total available pixels. This percentage will be a setting in Pimera that the end user can specify. Now that we've answered those questions, let's talk about the first challenge I encountered when I started writing the detection logic. Specifically, how do I convert YUV to grayscale for our motion detection algorithm? Turns out I don't have to. The Y plane of YUV420 is essentially grayscale, or at least for motion detection purposes, we can treat it as such. That is extremely convenient, and it results in less work for the CPU because we don't have to do step one of converting RGB to grayscale. We already have grayscale. So far, using Y plane data seems to be working fine. So let's look at the code. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of the surrounding code and go right to the core of it. Please ignore my comments, or don't. You, I'm just not going to talk about them at the moment. So here is where we get access to the Y plane data. And here is the loop that does the detection logic, which is take a difference of pixels, get the absolute value, compare against a threshold. If it's above it, we have a changed pixel, increment a counter. That's the core of it. It's really pretty simple. So y is a uint8 buffer. This represents how many items there are in that. This is a buffer that I've um, had the previous frame data in. We subtract it, get absolute value. This, for debugging purposes, I was just counting how many pixels we actually did compare so that it would match, uh, to make sure that it would match the Y length. And I'm using motion frame. Um, so if I detect that a pixel has changed, uh, I'm going to bump its value all the way to 255, which is going to be stark white. So that way those pixels will stand out against all the others in the frame. So that way I can preview motion frame in the browser uh, just to see you know, what, what pixels triggered motion detection. That's really the gist of it. Um, I set these, uh, let's see, actually, so I, then I use changed pixel count against our pixels for motion setting, which let's see where that is uh, right here. I should have just searched for it. That would have been a lot easier. Search is your friend. Okay. So it is my Y length, which is the how many pixels we have in the Y data plane, and then whatever the percentage 
um, for motion. Let's see, so that would be, uh, I think right now, defaulting it to half a per percent, or is that 5%? I can't remember exactly what I'm multiplying by, but that's beside the point. So let's go back and look at some other things, some other hurdles that I encountered. Uh, the first we already talked about was what do we do with, you know, how do we get grayscale data for motion detection? We already covered that. The next was uh, what I wanted to do was convert either the motion frame or the actual uh, grayscale data to a JPEG. So that way I could preview it. Right now, it was just saving to a disk right here. So I could see those frames that you know, were motion was detected. So briefly, if our change pixel count is above our pixels for motion threshold, I'm going to print some debugging info. Uh, this is a count or how long it took to run through this loop up here. So there's a start timer, there's an end timer. So that way I know that is way too slow for 1080p. It takes 500 milliseconds to loop through all those, those pixels. And it's understandable. It's doing a lot of work. And hopefully in my next video I will um, use SIMD instructions. So there's some ARM intrinsic functions that I can use to basically operate on more than one pixel at a time. Instead of doing this for each pixel, I'll be doing it in batches of eight, which should, should drastically cut down on time and CPU usage. It'd be great. I'm excited about that one. So that should be the next video. Okay. So in here, I was previewing the motion frame. So I was going to see what the normal frame looks like, and then the pixels that where motion was detected, they would be stark white. So what I was thinking I could do is, hey, I'm only working with one plane of data. Why can't I um, just send it one uh, plane of data and have libjpeg convert it for me? But that didn't quite work because, again, I'm dealing with um, raw data because I'm, I have YUV data, so that's considered raw. Um, that's why I'm using write raw data here just like I was um, for, I think in the previous video I showed just, just saving the frames as JPEG. So I'm dealing with raw data because I have YUV coming from the camera. And I was thinking, well, okay, maybe I could just use components of one and maybe set the color space to grayscale and just have it, um, that maybe not need the UV planes at all. That didn't end up working. Um, something really odd happened where the resulting JPEG had the right dimensions, but only about half of the screen had pixel data in it. The rest was just blurred, copied down. So it's almost as if when you use my assumption, and I have not verified this, I have not submitted a, an issue request with it. My assumption is that when you use raw mode, which let's see where the setting is. Where is the setting? So there should be one of these for grayscale. There it is right here. Okay, I'm gonna use raw mode. I think it always assumes that you have three components worth and it ends up somehow getting the data from somewhere else, maybe consuming it from um, the Y plane data. I'm not surely sure. That is a mystery for another time. So what I ended up doing was just using three components and stubbing out the U and V planes of data with just constant values of 128, which should force it to be presented as grayscale in the resulting image and on screen. So basically, whatever the UV plane size would normally be, I calculated that based on stride and however many um, rows I was going to be uh, passing into libjpeg. I you know, prepared some pointer buffers for that. And then, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So this is calculated ahead of time. 
I don't need to recalculate the UV rows for every frame. It's just constant fixed static data. So all I do is update the Y row pointers. This contains, you know, the first element is the Y rows. The second and third elements are the, the static UV, data, UV row data. Okay, long-winded way of saying in order to write grayscale, I couldn't figure out the right way to do it with minimal data. I ended up using the wide plane as is and stubbing in constant values of 128 for all the U and V data. And that ends up working just fine. I get a grayscale image and that's all I really needed to get out of this just to be able to preview which frames uh, had motion. Okay. I will update the code in the repo so you can see this. I'll push commit and push these changes. In the next video, I would love to cover converting this um, to use ARM SIMD intrinsic functions, which will let us back batch all these pixel operations, you know, for, for eight pixels at a time. I've been play, playing around with it here just seeing what it takes to, to load data into those uh, wide registers, those vector processing registers, and then do um, operations on them. So they actually have, <laughs> a little teaser, so they actually have the subtraction and absolute value wrapped into a single function, or uh, I believe it's even a single uh, assembly you know, CPU instruction. So this should be a lot faster than the C counterpart, which is going to be great. So, and then I'll have to do some compares and then, you know, add up how many were changed somehow cleverly. I'll have to experiment with that ahead of time and, and figure it out. But so that's what we'll cover in the next video, I think, is converting this motion detection loop to SIMD instructions for, for speed. Because for 644, but by 480, this loop takes 40 milliseconds, which is just not acceptable, especially if I want this app to be able to run at higher frame rates. All right, I will see you next time.